No one knew when and why Wells chose to read certain chapters from Moby Dick. The fragments found in the archives reveal no particular plan. Wells obviously worked on parallel projects whenever he had the time and inclination. basement of Xanadu. Old Orson wasn't anything like that. He didn't keep memorabilia and I would say that uh, two import most important things for him, he said, were a good pair of shoes and a good typewriter. And I must add that he had two more things. One is this 16 millimeter editing table that went all over the world with us. And something more precious than that, at least for me, is this suitcase. Often people took Orson Cigar as his trademark, but to me it was this suitcase. It contained, as he used to say, the tools of his profession. During these years we were on the road most of the time and Orson wanted to be able to shoot at any moment in any place. We traveled for months with the very unusual objects, which he used to tie up different scenes, uh, different locations, projects. Seeing our luggage, people must have thought that we were completely crazy. His creative life was like that of a nomad's. He followed the films he acted in. The roles were not always the best, but the pay financed his own projects. He'd get paid and appear on his own sets. The nomad director traveled with his films in his bags. Wherever he got his images and motifs, a scene here, a shot there, they became the sets of his inner world. Traveling, filming, traveling, a window frame in a landscape, and suddenly a new idea, a humorous portrait of Churchill. Sir, what are the desirable qualifications for a young man who wishes to become a politician? The ability to foretell what is going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, and next year. And to have the ability to explain afterwards why it didn't happen. Mr. Churchill, what is it like to know that the hall will be packed to overflowing every time you make a political speech? I always remember that if I was being hanged, the crowd would be twice as big. Hanging if properly conducted is, I believe, an absolutely painless death. Well, it may come to that. Winston, I can neither for your politics nor your face. Do not distress yourself, my dear. You are not likely to come into contact with either. If you were my husband, I'd poison your coffee. If you were my wife, I'd drink it. Winston, you are drunk. And you, my dear, are ugly. But tomorrow, I'll be sober. This is a town for a sweet tooth. Sweet things to listen to. Sweet things to look at. And sweet things to eat. Schwarzwälder Torte, Gugelhupf, Burgtheaterlinse, Topfenschnitten, Kaffeecremetorte, Nusstorte, Ebercreme, Italianschen, gemischte Cognacfrüchte, Streisel, Würfelgügel und Sackertorte. When the world was young, I used to run riot in there. How sweet it was. You know, there's an old English, no, Irish, Irish proverb, and I'm not making this up, it's real. Beware of three things, it goes. Beware of three things, the wicked west wind, the potato blight, and the smile of an Englishman. Well, I'd like to amend that to the smile of an English tailor. Do you mind standing naturally, sir? I am standing naturally. No. Are you really? Good gracious. Are we ready, Mr. Johnson? Quite ready, Mr. Mapleton. Eighteen. Eighteen. Sixteen. Sixteen. Eleven and a half. Eleven and a half. Seven and three quarters. Seven and three quarters. What is it? Oh. 
God bless my soul. <laughs> That's a good one, eh? <laughs> Make a note, Mr. Johnson. Right shoulder, three inches dropped. My right shoulder? Well, I can assure you, sir, no one else is. Three inches? Make that three and a half, Mr. Johnson. Fourteen? Fourteen. And incredible, though, it and may seem. And incredible, though, it may seem. Fifty-three. Three buttons, one to fasten, if possible, one breast pocket and two sides. Now, I always like to have a pocket uh, where I... I... should advise you to leave the pocket situation to us, sir. If you don't mind. Certainly, sir. Eighteen. Eighteen. Nine and a half. Nine and a half. Three. Three. Good Lord. Do not wear suspenders, sir. No doubt on account of our veins. <laughs> well, today is the 23rd of April. Shall we say the first fitting around about the 9th of December? First, the 9th of December? Well, I... This, I take it, sir, is a wallet. A wallet? This, sticking out at the back. No, that's me. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'd never have mentioned it if I'd known. How very unfortunate for you. Mr. Stewart, sir, we shall do everything we can in the most difficult circumstances imaginable. I suppose you'll be requiring this. Uh, Off the peg, I take it. And a most peculiarly shaped peg, sir, uh, <sighs> if I may say so. <clears throat> Good, Good morning, morning sir. sir. Wells loved stories and tales, but his own life gave birth to legends that obscured his true biography. A fire was said to have destroyed his house in Spain. He supposedly lost his favorite keepsakes, photos, letters, documents, and even unfinished films. But his house in Madrid stands unscathed to this day. The line between fact and fantasy is blurred. The Deep, another legendary project whose very existence is often doubted. With this self-financed thriller, Wells sought to reach a mass audience. Dear Chuck, the scene here might be useful for a voiceover for the end of your introduction. Actually, the fire comes at the end of the picture. We're out in the Pacific Ocean. A newly wedded couple are here on their small yacht, cruising up the west coast of Africa on their way to the Mediterranean. Not a breath of air, so they're becalmed. To save gas, they're not using their auxiliary engine. Out in these waters, they might expect to be very much alone, but there's someone else out there. Another boat. Somebody is rowing over to them. The stranger has a very strange tale to tell. He's alone. Everyone else on that boat of his is dead. Friends agreed to play the part. As he was acting in Dalmatia, the Adriatic became the Pacific. But financial problems arose once again. The film's completion was postponed for a year.
trapped there on a boat that's shipping water fast and ready to sink. Johnny, help me! Please, Johnny! And his young wife, trapped on their boat with a raving maniac. Help! What happens next? I'll have to leave that to the ticket buyers. Lawrence Harvey's death finally made the film's completion impossible, although only a few scenes are missing. About the same time on the Mediterranean, Wells began another project, The Merchant of Venice. A few pictures of the carnival had to suffice for the atmosphere. The Merchant of Venice was to be a short television adaptation of the play. The financing was all set, but Wells had trouble with the tax authorities. The financiers pulled out, and Wells tried to complete it on his own so as not to have another unfinished film on his hands. Expensive Venice was replaced by a small village on the Dalmatian coast. Shylock, albeit I neither lend nor borrow, by taking nor by giving of excess, yet to supply the ripe want of my friend, I'll break a custom. Is he yet possessed how much he would? Uh, uh, Three thousand ducats. It is a good round sum. And for three months? Mm. Three months from twelve. Let me see the fate. Well, Shylock, shall we be beholding to you? Signor Antonio, many a time and oft on the Rialto, you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat, dog, and spit upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for the use of that which is my own. Go to that. You come to me and you say, Shylock, 